Keith, how is everything? It's going well. Thank you for having me, Fergus. No, thank you for being here. And I think it would be rude of me not to begin by asking about your surname. It's very local to where I am, and you do have some Scottish roots, don't you? Oh, yeah, we have we have pretty deep roots in Scotland. Uh, my daughter's over there in Edinburgh right now studying. She said, Dad, the Campbells don't have a great reputation over here. And I said, sweetheart, we're a powerful clan. Don't let them bring you down. Just, uh, it's okay. But yeah, we have a lot of roots in Scotland. It's a wonderful place, and I love it there whenever I can get there. Do you know what your tartan looks like? Have you gone there? Oh, of course, dude. I got the whole outfit. I'm an American with Scottish descent. We love that stuff. <laughs> I mean, we go over there. I got, I've got the tweed jacket. I've got the whole academic outfit. You know, I've got the, I've got the tartan everything. I mean, I'm, I'm the worst tourist there is. You guys love That's me. That's the best possible, best answer I could have hoped for. To be fair, it was either all in or not at all, and you are a very oh. clear one end of the spectrum. Yeah, I just drive through the Highlands. I'll come back with a you know, stuffed Harry Koo and some Campbell tartan and, uh, you know, a bunch of scones. I just leave all my money there. You're like one of the, um, one of the lights that attracts flies and keeps them stuck to it, yeah. but you're just driving through the highlands, absorbing, absorbing touristy gifts. Uh, you, no, very, you need me. Very wise. You want me there just to keep your economy afloat. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, Keith, first of all, thank you for propping up our economy. But, uh, second of all, what is narcissism? Ah. Uh, Narcissism. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than it sounds. The simplest version is sort of an inflated or you know overly positive view of one of of yourself. You think you're better than you are, but really the words used in a few different ways. Um, so when most people are talking about narcissism, they're talking about a personality trait, meaning you know some of us are more than others. And we're talking about a trade that involves some, you know, high levels of self-confidence, high levels of extrover or extroversion, but also some sort of sense of entitlement, meanness, sense of superiority. I'm better than other people. Um, maybe some charm and charisma. So, so that's sort of your classic narcissistic character you meet, a charming, uh, you know, I don't know, a charming actor, charming politician, religious figure. That's what most people, I think, have in mind with narcissism, bad ex-boyfriend. Um, there's also two other forms of narcissism that people don't think about as much. One is this more uh, vulnerable form of narcissism. People who think they're a big deal, but they're also really insecure. They don't go out and put themselves out in the world. They might have low self-esteem. They feel they haven't gotten a fair shake in life. So that more vulnerable narcissism is what you see sometimes in therapy. I think I think when people talk about the online incel community, which I don't really understand, but I think there's a lot of vulnerable narcissism in that. A and then uh, to make it more confusing, there's an actual psychiatric disorder or a personality disorder called narcissistic personality disorder, which your psychiatrist or psychologist can diagnose you with. It's relatively rare, We're talking one or 2% of the population. And that's when your sort of your ego, your narcissism becomes so extreme, it, it messes up your life in, an, in a significant way. It can ruin your relationships, it can be, it ruin your ability to function at work, it can screw up your business if you have a business because you're overconfident, you're, you have terrible relationships with people, et cetera. So narcissism, the short version is I'm a self-centered jerk, but it, it's a lot more complicated than that. So in terms of definitions to consider for those listening, grandiose and vulnerable are the two to really worth bearing in mind, aren't they? It, it, obviously, because I assume 99.9% .9 of people listening won't be suffering with the disorder side of things, which is obviously a more professional discussion to be had. But from a personality day-to-day -day point of view, grandiose v. vulnerable. Exactly. Yeah. So, And again, when, when you think about narcissism, what you're probably going to think about if you're a normal listener is the more grandiose form. Those are the people we see kind of showing off and doing their thing. The more vulnerable form is what you're going to see clinically. It's somebody who's in their head thinks they're a big deal, but you're not going to necessarily see that from the outside. Do you have any data on which is actually more prevalent? Because obviously grandiose narcissism ah. will be more obvious yeah. to us, whereas vulnerable will be more hidden. That, that's a great question. I think that it's a it's a challenge to answer because where do you draw the line? We're really just measuring these things at a population level. 
And so it's hard to say, well, there's an absolute level of this versus an absolute level of that to compare. Uh, what I can say is you find them in a little different places. So grandiosity, you're going to see a little more male, uh, whereas vulnerability seems to be evenly distributed between males and females. Um, you're going to see more grandiosity, grandiosity and sort of, well, the classic grandiose nar narcissist would be a young male, you know, 25 who wants to be a surgeon or something like that, you know, going into some sort of highly competitive career. Um, and vulnerability would look different, but the rates, it's hard to, it's hard to compare. Okay. Okay. And how do we spot it, whether that's in somebody else or in ourselves, more importantly? Yeah. So narcissism is something that you can see, uh, you can see in different places in people by looking at sort of their outward appearance, their history, their their uh the ways of communicating but it's it's hard to see if you start dating somebody or you're voting for somebody so it's not like this is super easy but generally people who are more grandiose they will present themselves in a more polished and put together way at least online they take more consideration into their grooming so they want to look better because that's important to them um, they're likely to be more confident. They're likely to be likable when you meet them. So when you meet people who are more narcissistic in the first 30 seconds, you're like, yeah, I like that person. They seem confident, outgoing. Um, when you look at their, uh, their performance in a group, often they'll draw attention to themselves. So there's a group of people talking and somebody's a little louder and drawing attention to himself or herself, making jokes being the center of attention, that can be a little bit of a clue. So you can look for things like that. You can look at somebody's history and what you're gonna see with somebody who's narcissistic is they have a history of damaged relationships. They've, they've had relationships with people and they've fallen apart. Um, they've lied to or manipulated those people. So you're gonna see a history of bad relationships. Um, it, it's much harder to see the more vulnerable narcissism. That's going to look more like shyness or anxiety when you first meet it. Where do we draw the line between narcissism and ego then? Because obviously there's a lot of crossover. And when you bring 25-year-olds wanting to be surgeons and driving 911s into the picture, it's it's there's a big question around ego. But a lot of what you described there from a grandiose point of view could equally be placed into the same context context as the discussion around ego, couldn't it? So where, from a scientific point of view, do we do we draw the considerations? It, it's very much, I think, ego as a scientific term is really a broad term. It can mean anything from like, hey, this is just how your self works, your personality works, that's your ego, to you're a bit of an egotist. You focus on your own individual self versus other people. So I think our use of the term ego and narcissism are going to align. One of the big issues with narcissism versus just being self-centered is that desire to be better than other people and put other people down, that more antagonistic piece. So if you're like, yeah, I'm a big deal. I got a car. I'm going to be a surgeon. But you're a pretty nice guy on top of that. You're at like, hey, you could ride in my car. And hey, when I'm a surgeon, I'll you know have you you know, I'll hook you up when you can't get in or whatever. People are going to still like you, even though you got an ego. So you go, yeah, he's, he's kind of got an ego, but he's a good guy. So a lot of times it's that antagonism. You're like, I got an ego. And by the way, Keith, I'm better than you. Oh, your car sucks, Keith. Have you seen my car? Oh, you're going to be a family physician, not a surgeon. Well, that's going to be hard to feed your family, LOL. So that that kind of superiority and interpersonal meanness is that's kind of the worst part of narcissism that's the most toxic so part. it's almost the value system that sits behind the individual that sets apart the difference in many ways isn't it because in that specific example the only real distinction i can see is, is whether the person is morally good or not and therefore that comes from a place of compassion most first and well, foremost that's a, that's a great question because it really there is a real alignment between you know at, at the personality trait level we'd say that person is nicer more agreeable more considerate uh but at a moral level that looks like being a good person so they they line up really well and if you know if we were having a deep I could get into some history of personality stuff where that actually, anyway, but I'm not going to because that'd be 45 minutes and I'd have to explain a lot of stuff. But yeah, there is a real alignment between being a good person 
and being a non-narcissistic person in a way. So, you know, ideally, if I if I describe somebody as narcissistic, I'm saying they're not a morally really good person. Interesting. They usually don't correlate. They kind of go the opposite direction in general. Is that the same for both versions or is that only specific to grandiose? Uh, I think for both versions, what you'll see is that high level of antagonism or that uh, antagonist sort of meanness, callousness to other person people. The difference is with people who are grandiose, they're a little more likely to do things like they're more likely to say, hey, I'm better than you. Hey, let's have a competition to show who's better and I'm going to win. And somebody who's more vulnerable is more likely to sit at home and stew. God, that Keith, you know, he was out there and I'm going to get him next time. Next time I'm going to do this and I'm going to show him the real alpha male. So the grandia, the, the vulnerable narcissism, a lot of this, what we call self-regulation or dominance seeking or status seeking is happening in their own head. It's like a fantasy game rather than reality. I've heard you bring to life with context the the sort of vulnerable narcissism side of things through school shooters as an example because they spend a lot of time as you said stewing things over thinking they deserve more thinking they should have been x y or z without actually taking the action that as you've indicated a grandiose narcissist might have taken yeah exactly so well i mean i just read in your background you're a high performance guy right like i i just looked you up like you're a you're a high performance athlete right Am I right? I hope uh, yeah, I read yeah. that. Yeah, I, I I'm, I'm, to... I'm high performing at balancing different sports that don't necessarily speak to one another. But if you put me in a group of people that are high performing in any one of those individual sports, I'd probably get smoked. If that makes sense. Oh, so I, I get I, it. Yeah, Same yeah. with me. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm... I, I get it. I suck at writing. I suck at math. But put them together in psychology, I'm pretty good. <laughs> My point is, you're a high performance guy. You hang around with high performance guys and people aren't there bragging, showing off, putting people down. You're not waking up in the morning. Today, I'm going to show the world what I can do because every day you get up, you do your best. You show the world what you're going to do. Some days you succeed, some you fail. That's the nature of the game. And you, have, you over time, you get some healthy self-respect, but you don't need to go out there and show off, right? vulnerable narcissist in your head you've never done anything so you're telling this fantasy to yourself i'm going to be the winner i'm going to win that race i'm going to be on the podcast i'm going to do this and and it and in your mind it becomes like this huge triumph the worst cases are when they go out and have something like a school shooting i'm going to show people who's the most dominant person and i'm going to do that by shooting people because then i'm the real alpha and all you guys who thought you were a big deal were pretenders so normally healthy high success people just kind of can regulate in the world they're not fantasizing all the time about succeeding or failing they just go out there they do their thing people are more vulnerable because they're not out there doing it that they live in this very intense fantasy world and when it breaks into reality it can get kind of ugly so i did a video on masculinity on my youtube channel and 90 percent of the comments were overwhelmingly positive obviously the uh the loyal subscribers came first and then the dregs of the internet came second but with the dregs came a lot of people calling themselves alpha males and my snap reaction to that was people that are focusing on things that would typically make them fall into that category by their own definition are not the sort of people that would spend time commenting angrily on strangers videos on the internet which really feeds into a term i've heard you use before which is the basement narcissist which is almost a oh, subcategory yeah. within the vulnerable narcissist isn't it yeah it, it's a it's it, i mean not a formal subcategory, but it's sort of a colloquial way of thinking about it, a basement narcissist. It's somebody who's living in their mom's basement, you know, fantasizing about how great they are and how much attention they should be getting from everybody, but not actually in the world doing anything. And so that's where you have this huge conflict between the fantasy of who I am and the reality of who I am, which isn't much. And when it breaks, you end up with the I'm the alpha male. I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to blow this thing up. It's not healthy. I mean, the the way to, first of all, no alpha male says they're an alpha male because <laughs> that would be ridiculous. And secondly, the way to succeed is you just have to go out there and get your butt kicked over and over for years 
and and you hustle your way and work your way and grind your way up to a place where you respect yourself and people respect you. But it's a hard process. It is, and one of my favorite phrases of all time. I think it was by Winston Churchill, but apparently every single quote ever was by Winston Churchill, so who really knows? But it was that success is going through failure after failure without a loss of enthusiasm. And that's where I really see that ring true with what you've just said, because essentially it's people that are waking up and doing the work because the work needs done, rather than doing the work because yeah. they feel that doing the work will externally validate them to people that don't actually care in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, it's a really good way of putting it. And seeking that kind of external validation isn't it, it's it's not going to be ultimately fulfilling. It just doesn't work that way. Um, I don't blame people for doing it. You know, you feel empty, you go ex seek external validation. I don't blame anyone, but it's not super fulfilling in the long run. So given that we live in a world that is so externally validating in terms of how we measure ourselves, our, our bank balance that it equals success, our job title equals prestige, our white picket fence equals the American dream, do you think that the Western world specifically, again, I don't want to get into sort of faction denominations yeah. too much, but America, the UK, those that exist with the mindset that we do, does it promote or encourage narcissism in a way? Yeah, I, I think I think very much. I think um, the way sort of our modern industrial capitalist urban society uh, has evolved is that people who are narcissistic do better. So people who are narcissistic do better in urban environments where they don't know people because they're better at going out and meeting people. Um, they tend to come from smaller families because they have a little more focus on themselves. Uh, they tend to be more competitive, so they do well competing for jobs. They do better in job interviews, so they're better at sort of, you know, high speed play, you know, high speed speed economies. If you're in a small town in Northern England and everybody knows you since you were f five years old, it's hard to be a big deal because you're like, I'm a big deal. And they're like, yeah, I remember when you were six and fell on your butt. So. And you can go to a big city and you can recreate yourself. So these cities are really good feeding grounds for narcissism. And I think our our general culture, which is buy stuff to build an identity to get esteem on the internet, is, you know, that whole consumer capitalism is really good for narcissism. But what I didn't predict would happen, I thought, well, this is great. We're going to just throw everybody online, tell them they're legends, and they're all going to be kings of some online universe, and everyone will be happy. I thought we'd have this sort of great fantasy migration. But what happened is it became very, very competitive. So even though society is pulling for narcissism, what happens is some people are really good at it, the influencers, the professionals, and it leaves a lot of us feeling worse than we would have if we hadn't had the internet in the first place, we hadn't had modernity in the first place, because we're comparing ourselves to all these successful, good looking people. And we're like, God, we're kind of just mediocre average people. I feel terrible now for being just pretty good. Um, so I don't think it's worked as well as I'd hoped. It hasn't made everybody happy. So we've touched on it there, and it's probably as good a segue as any to, to speak on the obvious question that's probably on everyone's mind right now, which is, what role does social media play in, as you've coined yourself, the epidemic of narcissism in the modern world? Uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, when we first started looking at this, I mean, when I first looked at social media, it was like a fringe topic. And this is probably 15 years ago now. Um, and what you find is social media is a really good social ground for grandiose narcissism. So when you look at Facebook and Twitter and WeChat, um, you look across the sites, people who are narcissistic have more friends or followers or connections. They do well on these sites. They, they're good at taking selfies without their shirt on. There's a lot of advantages to being narcissistic for social media. So it really pulls for narcissism. Um, and what that means is that when any of us go on social media and we look at our phone, what we're going to see in our social graph or our social world is more narcissism than really is there. Because narcissists are overrepresented on social media. So when we look at the world through the lens of social media, what we see is this narcissistic world. People are self-promoting and they're talking about themselves. Um, and it's not necessarily like that. So we get a bit of a distorted view of how Americans or, or British are. 
because of what we see on the internet versus what we see in real life. Um, but yeah, social media is just a big narcissist. I mean, grandiose narcissism is one of the primary drivers of, of making social media work. Humor, cat videos are part of it. Rage is part of it. You know, it's just rage bait and there's humor. But ego is just a huge part of the whole system. So bear with me on this, because a lot of what you've described falls into some of the categories that I place myself in, in that whilst I'm an athlete in many ways, a lot of what I do is documented online on multiple platforms with the aim of trying to encourage others to experience the sort of journey that I've been on from a personal point of view and that 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 we have a proven track record record of that being the case but the nature of doing that means that i am almost encouraged to talk more specifically about myself rather than thing in general terms but i wouldn't consider myself a grandiose narcissist within the framework that you've referenced because i'd like to think that deep down i am a good and moral person so how do I know whether I'm a narcissist or not? Is essentially the question, yeah. which is not 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 actually something I had written down to to ask in in this yeah. conversation. But I feel it's something worth touching upon because there might be people listening yeah. that feel the same as I do. But you've yeah. described so many things that cross over with my day to day that I thought, oh no, have I accidentally dug yeah. myself into a hole here? Well, you've hit the problem. Is the way to get successful? in the modern world is you have to put yourself out there and you have to feed the algorithm. You have to put out content and you have to do it reliably and you have to link it to your own story and your own narrative. So people feel a connection with you. So that's literally the job. So you have to, you have to reveal about yourself. You have to say, I'm a high status person. You have to do good things. Well, that is like, Hey, narcissist, come over here. There's some cameras. You get to talk about yourself. So what happens is, yeah, people are narcissistic, love this, but everyone else has to do the same darn thing. I have to get on social media, talk about myself, tell people why I'm a big deal. Everybody has to do it. That's the job. It's really hard. So three things. One, I can tell you you're not that narcissistic just from talking to you for five seconds. I shouldn't share that because I tell people I can't judge, but I can. You're okay. Secondly, um, a lot of it is the the motivation for doing it. And is part of that motivation putting good information out? Are you trying to build, are you trying to make other people better? Because if you're focusing on making other people better, it's going to come back to you. There's a way to do it. It's kind of, you know, win-win versus trying to extract status from people. Um, and so if you're going in it more in extraction way, but I don't see any way around it. The different, this is actually something that Chris Williams mentioned that I thought was really a good point said if you if you want to be famous at least have a thing you're doing that's not that's in addition to be famous so it's where reality tv has completely distorted that status game hasn't it because people are becoming exactly. famous for just being people rather than they're actually right. doing anything extraordinary so so when i started studying this i remember a uh, paris hilton you know paris hilton was famous for being paris hilton i thought this is just wild and the kardashians when the, that whole phenomenon there were people in the 70s like that and in the 30s like that but really this whole phenomenon of being famous for just being famous was you know so interesting but i think the idea of being really good at something and you might get some attention for that or you might not, but at least you love what you're doing and you're helping a niche community. I think that's a better approach than just going, hey, I want to be famous on the internet <laughs> for, for nothing. I mean, it's, uh, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I don't know, people People really want fame. Uh, it, I don't know why, because it doesn't pay you. And, and there's lots of disorders that go with fame, you, you know, hassle, you get body dysmorphia, you get narcissism, you have to worry about your appearance all the time, you're constantly worried about the status. Fame cycles used to be years and now they're literally minutes or days you're famous for, so it's an impossible task. I wouldn't recommend it as my life goal for anyone. I think Alex Hormozzi's sort of encapsulated that really well that point you just made there specifically because i think he was very commercially driven very business and financially driven for so many years in the shadows because he couldn't see any merit to being famous he wanted to remain quiet because he didn't want anyone to know he was wealthy he didn't want anyone to sort of recognize him in the street he didn't want any of the trappings of fame because he was focusing on the outputs that could potentially come with it 
But once he'd met that and gone through that process and that journey of understanding what you need to build to be able to actually commercialize certain things, and then he saw what happens when you turn the tap on from a visibility point of view, that's where it can become more merit focused. Whereas becoming famous for the sake of being famous, if you don't have anything to sell, if you're not an expert in anything, if you're not able to be a thought leader on the reason that you're famous in the first place, then there's no direction that you can push anyone in. And I think that's the problem is that you're sort of starting, you're starting at the back rather than the front, rather than The Rock, for example, who spent most of his career building up to the point where I've started a tequila brand. Oh, it's worth over a billion dollars. Why? Because of the marketing channel that came with it. But the important thing is his fame was based on merit and not on fame itself. Whereas, I mean, some of the TV that I see pop up these days, I'll see a Netflix trailer for Selling Sunset. The most recent Netflix trailer for Selling Sunset came up for me the other day, which is the something beginning with O group real estate in Los Angeles and Miami and things. And I think it just started off as any other real estate show where we're going to show people nice houses, we're going to take rich people rich people to it, we're going to maybe have a bit of drama and a bit of negotiations, all very exciting. Yeah. And now it just looks like the most toxic, egotistical, false, ridiculous, scripted load of rubbish I've ever seen in my life. And there it is, number three in the UK today. And I'm just sitting there like, no, <laughs> why? And I just can't, I can't process why people engage with it so passionately because there's no substance behind what's happening when there is substance to be found elsewhere. Toxic people are entertaining. I mean, when you look at you look at reality television and what you get is a lot of personality disorders. You get a lot of narcissism. You get a lot of borderline kind of behaviors. And then they get people drunk and then they start telling them they start causing conflict on top of that. The producers start feeding them stuff and then they start selectively editing it out. So it looks like the most I mean, it's just drama. But you take normal, <clears throat> excuse me, normal, high functioning people lives don't have a lot of drama because drama sucks no one wants drama so when you're grown up you don't want drama normal people want peace and they want success and they want to do good things and so you know you don't make a show about that no you don't it's not very stylish these days is it so i think no. with that with that context what actually led you from a personal point of view to be so fascinated with this from an academic setting because there's so many directions you can go with the discipline that you're going to focus on, but you have become an expert on narcissism. So what was the what was the question that you were aiming to address when you began this journey? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's been a long time, um, but there's a few things. I think one is a, kind of the academic question. This is really nerdy, but people, there's a belief that everybody's self-enhanced, meaning we all think we're a little better than we are. So if I go to my if I'm teaching a class and I say, how attractive are you guys on a one to 10 scale compared to the rest of the class? The average in the class will be about a six and a half. So people on average think they're above average. If I think, you know, are you smarter than people in this class? Yeah, I'm about a seven compared to. So most of us kind of, we we kind of think we're better than we are a little bit. And that's cool. That's just this basic self enhancement uh, that we have. Um, what I got interested in is, is maybe some people do this more than others. And it turns out that that's where narcissists... So it's very much a theoretical question about the nature of the self. It's, do, does everyone self-enhance? Yeah, but some people really do this in a strategic way and other people not so much. And there's different ways you can get through life. That was one reason. And then I think more philosophically, it was more coming from this Buddhist perspective of what is the non-self? What's it? What is the, you know, what could I be like without this ego system operating all the time, interfering with me? And it was very hard for me to understand that when I was a 25 year old academic, um, but I could study narcissism and then I could see the ego. So if you you look at people with big egos, I mean, you can just watch it and it's very easy to see. And you go, oh, that's how the ego works. That's how you get esteem. That's how you get attention. That's why you're doing this. So it's, you know, really my goal would be to figure out what the ego, what it's like without the ego. But instead, I kind of figured out what it's like with the ego turned up to 11. On a day-to-day basis, has this made you more informed or less informed when it comes to managing your own ego? Do you still find yourself 
being caught out in terms of that that sort of egotistical feeling that we get every once in a while or are you more content with who you are what you're focused on what you're doing where you don't really need to confront your ego as much as you did previously yeah i am uh i i have I've noticed that things with myself and when you study something, you kind of see it in yourself and you and you sort of work on it. So I've noticed with myself a few things. I'm not really narcissistic, but I'm very extroverted and I can just run right over people if I if I don't stop myself. So I can go to an academic conference and somebody's like, hey, I'm interested in squid. I'm like squid. And I'll talk for 20 minutes and just stample on just stomp people because my energy. So I'm like, I should probably dial that back a little bit. So I've been working on that. Um, I have a pretty good sense of entitlement. I'm like, hey, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy, but occasionally I'm like, no, you shouldn't do that. And I start getting pissed off, and I realize where the Campbell Scotland, you know, this Campbell Scottish Highland genes come out, and I'm ready to go to war with the world. And I have to sort of meditate and go, you know, you can't go to war with the world every day. It's just not. <laughs> so, yeah, dude, I'm take, talking take myself. Take the tartan war clothing off. <laughs> yeah. Take the take the clothing off, man. It's okay. To take the, you know, the, jacka, just... the Jacobite and makeup off and <laughs> put that all to the side. Yeah. I mean, that's so like, dude, I got issues. I'll be honest. I got issues. Uh, I see him pop up. I see rage. I see ego. And uh and I just try to keep it in check. Um, and uh, and the other thing is I've, I've been talking, I've been doing academia a long time. So I have a real job, but I've talked to the press for 25 years, 20 years. So every once in a while, I'll get famous for like a day. You know, it'd be like two days and then no one. So I've been lucky enough to kind of go see these cycles. So I don't get that attached to stuff. I just see what's the What's the about- biggest spike being there? Oh, I don't, I mean, I had stuff that, like, when we first studied, you know, narcissism and Facebook, I remember the BBC, like, researchers say all narciss- all Facebookers are narcissists, and I started getting hate mail from the UK, and I'm, oh my God, people are want me dead, I mean, stuff like that, it was just, well, Rogan, I guess that's a big one, but like, um, but any of these times, you get attention, and it gets a big spike, you'll have like, two weeks of attention and then it just goes away for me for normal famous people it's two weeks all the time is there a part of you that wants to sort of chase that dragon or are you quite happy with the spikes as 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 they ebb and flow oh i i um i'm i've uh thought about chasing the dragon before but i see where the dragon goes and i've watched people do it and there's a big study done on celebrities and narcissism by a guy named Dr. Drew. I don't know if he's over in the U.S. Drew Pinsky. He's a kind of a, a celebrity. He was an MTV doctor and a guy named Mark Young. He's a professor at, at USC. And they collected narcissism data on celebrities out in L.A. I had a long talk with Mark about it. And celebrities aren't real happy as a group because they're always chasing they're chasing the dragon. They're chasing the fame hit. And it, and it's very hard to get because there's not that much room at the top. So I, I could see chasing it, but I just find I don't because it's not worth it to me. But I could certainly see doing it because it's a real, like there's something really tempting about it. It's, it's a drug. It's like a dopamine drug, I think. So where does nature versus nurture come into this? Because how susceptible an individual is to the pull of that proverbial drug in this case oh yeah i don't the the fame the fame itself as a drug is really interesting it's something people have written about a lot you know the idea of fame junkies or fame is kind of an addictive process um with most things like narcissism what you're looking at with with heritability estimates are somewhere 40 or 50 percent you know, maybe it's a little higher with intelligence, maybe it's a little lower with attitudes, but somewhere in there. So a lot of how we're wired, really the ma- majority or at least half of it seems to come from what we've inherited. And then the the rest of it is, you know, maybe 10 or 20 percent we get from our parents. You know, that it's not as much as we think from parenting. And then the rest seems to be from just our culture, just what we pick up from our random lives. Um, so early experiences. So you could imagine maybe you're sort of a 
wired for attention seeking you're wired for dopamine pretty happy go lucky person you're young you get a shot in a school play and you know you get some attention at age 10 and that really hits you and you're like oh my goodness this is it and that sticks in your mind and then you start focusing your life to get that attention um and maybe you had some trauma early on your dad was drinking you had some issues so you're like well i can't really get love it doesn't come naturally from the inside but i'm good at seeking it from the outside so that external validation is something that you're comfortable with and you could see how you would get shaped in a way to go out and seek external validation and if you're a good person and you're rewarded for it it could be you know kind of a healthy self-regulatory way of doing it you could do it in a healthy way but what could happen is if you if you're really lacking in self-love you have you have trauma you really need the external validation well, no one cares about psychologists anymore, Keith. We have AI and they're smarter than you. And I'm like, well, damn, how do I get attention? Well, maybe I'll start, you know, dressing up weird and doing dances in the street. Or maybe I'll do throw paint on some, you know, on David Hume's statue or something. Or maybe I'll do something else to get attention. Or maybe I'll say provocative stuff. So then I become, instead of the guy who was doing psychology, who's a pretty nice guy, I become the attention seeking kind of empty vampire who's always out there just trying to get his needs met and instead of just saying god i wish my dad loved me more and having a good cry cup of ayahuasca or something you know so for any parents listening how much can they do beyond encouraging a morally sound value system and how much do they just need to accept is down to the individual personality that comes with the lottery that is childbirth? You know, I I think in terms of being a parent, it's very hard. If you think I'm going to turn my kid into this kind of person or this kind of person, good luck. I mean, any parent who has two kids knows that I couldn't turn this one into this one or this one and this one. This one's an artist. They're a little crazy. They're a little adventurous. This one's neurotic. They're hardworking. This is what they They're just different people. What, what's the phrase is it child number one is is parenting child number two is surviving oh, or something like that that's it, it, mine uh, yeah i what i've always heard is you know this is the psychologist for your first parent when it, with your first parent your first child you believe in parenting with your second child you believe in genetics yeah, okay, that's there we go. what yeah. we, that's <laughs> so how we yeah. say it um because your first one you're like oh my god i'm the greatest parent ever and then it turns out you just got the lucky roll of the dice and number two setting the curtains on fire and you're like i'm doing the same thing um so it's very hard to change your kids what you can do very effectively if you're healthy is you can love your kids and have them know that every day they are loved so they don't have to go seek that from everyone else because they got that growing up so they don't need to go get it from the internet or from somebody else because they have it so you can love your kids, you can be a good role model for your kids. And um, well, I always, I usually say CPR, sort of encourage passion, responsibility, uh, compassion, responsibility, but also encourage passion. So one thing, um, just doing what you love and being really passionate about it, it's just a really healthy way to, to, to live your life. You know, getting out, you know, where you are getting out in the woods and hiking or surfing on the coast of Scotland or spay fishing. God, I'd love to spay fish in the River Spay one of these days. Bucket list. Doing stuff like that um, where you're really passionate about what you're doing and engaged, it makes you feel good. It puts you into flow states. It's healthy and it doesn't make you a jerk. Makes you kind of a better person. So encouraging passionate pursuits rather than getting attention from people, I think, can be a good thing for parents. And CPR isn't specific to parents alone, is it? That can be a individualistic no. focus. So for anyone listening that thinks, hmm, maybe I'm a little bit more narcissistic than I thought I was before I started listening yeah. to this podcast. If you focused on compassion, passion, and responsibility, those are three real core yeah. tenets that can pretty much guide you. In, as, as, long, as long as you're not massively misled on what those three things mean then they will point you in the right direction, won't they? It, it, I think so. It's pretty basic stuff. It's like, be you know, be kind to people, even though it hurts. Try to do stuff you love and don't worry about it, whatever that thing is, and really enjoy what you're doing and lose yourself in what you love. And then the responsibility taking is basically when you screw up, just saying, yeah, I own it. Accountability. Just own your own really. failures. Yeah. Accountability is a good word for it. It's like, 
hey, I screwed up. I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. And and with narcissism, it's hard to do that because you have to admit you're wrong. You know, so when you see people are narcissists like, how'd you screw up, Keith? I'm like, what do you mean it was your fault? It's everybody's fault but mine. It's that damn internet. It's the damn this. It's the damn that. Uh, when you go, yeah, I own it. It's all me. I'm going to do better next time. It hurts your ego in the short term, but it's super empowering because you're like, I can do what I want. So training yourself to kind of own failure and take responsibility, I think is it can help you succeed, but also dampen narcissism. So there was a study that I listen to i can't remember whether it was a podcast you were on or whether it was something i read online that was about chickens and when the highest yielding chickens were highlighted in a group and then pooled together as one big super group of high, highest yielding chickens the performance of the group plummeted because essentially the dynamic of that group of chickens i don't know any of the technical terms for I know a gaggle of geese is a thing, but a coup, a coup yeah, of chickens, I... a crew, a, a gang, <laughs> a gang. And essentially, the narcissists thrived in that environment because they could dominate those that they saw beneath them. But equally, those that saw themselves as beneath then operated better as part of a team, effectively was my understanding of it. And I've bastardized the explanation. But from that, the question really is, are narcissists necessary in our society? Yeah, that's a great. So that that is a study. I I I uh, remember reading it. It was in Poultry Science. It's a study of uh, how to make optimal chicken houses. So what they did was they're like, hey, we've got all these chicken houses, and what we should do is we'll get the best laying chicken from each of those houses and put them together, and we'll have a super chicken house. This is like what they do with sports teams. Like, hey, let's take the best player on these five teams and we'll put them together and have a super team. Or we'll take these five guitar players and make a super group. And the idea was, well, this will be the best producing chicken house ever. But it didn't work at all. It was a disaster. And this is what happens sometimes with sports teams, too. The reason why is because, as you described, these chickens are outperforming because they're exploiting everybody else. That chicken's the best in its house because it's taking it, stealing food from everybody. They suck. And so when you select as individuals to make teams, what can happen is you end up with really dysfunctional and narcissistic teams. So what you need to do if you're trying to build the optimal chicken house is you need to select for the team. You need to select at the level of the house not at the person. And this is hard for people to make sense of it. Another example of this is with astronauts. So when the original space program in the U.S., the first astronauts, Buzz Aldrin, you know, Armstrong, these were test pilots. These were super macho, you know, narcissistic, gutsy uh, people who could fly the twice the speed of the sound and were okay if they were going to die, Right. And you said, who do we want to launch to space? Well, we need those crazy guys because no one else is going to do it. Well, what happens if you took 10, <clears throat> took 10 Buzz Aldrin's, Aldrin's and put him in a spaceship and say, go float around Earth for six months? They're going to kill each other. They're going to start fighting for who's dominant. One of them's going to say, screw the mission. I'm flying to Mars. The others are going to go, OK, let's do it. They're not going to sit around in a tube and float around Earth because a bunch of nerds were telling them what to do. So modern astronauts, they had to select differently. They couldn't select high-charging narcissists. What they had to select was hyper-agreeable, but also super gutsy and super hardworking, nice people. So modern astronauts are kind of like Canadians. You know, they're up there in space like, hey, how you doing? We love it up here. We all get along like a team. It's just because if you brought... Because that's what you need to film a high a high performance team who's going to live together has to be a really nice group of people too. So when you're building high performance teams, you end up struggling with issues that you don't you don't deal with with individual performers. So do effective do effective leaders need to be narcissists? Ah, uh, it's a challenge because it, uh, effective leaders. Well, no, I'll make I'll put it this way. Emergent leaders tend to be narcissists, which means the people who become leaders, the people who want to be leaders and the people we often choose as leaders tend to be narcissists. But the people who are effective leaders typically aren't. 
Instead, they have more empathy for other people who they're following. And often they use something like servant leadership. So if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at leaders around the world, and I hate getting into politics. The example in my head now, just to take uh, any, in case you, you, choose, you want to be sensitive around the subject, I'll choose Donald Trump versus Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, if you know who she is. Very, very compassionate prime minister for New Zealand um, versus Donald Trump at the other end of the spectrum, who's arguably less compassionate. Yeah, I would say they didn't lock New Zealand down for a couple of years. I don't know. I, I I always wonder about the compassion of that. But I see that's exactly Donald Trump would be your classic, like strong man, kind of narcissistic leader. Um, Trump, Bolsonaro. Uh, who else are good examples of this? There's a lot of Putin, maybe there's a lot around the world. It's sort of strong man leaders. And then there's the more like uh, in New Zealand. Um, well, you get a lot in the in the parliamentary. You get nicer leaders with parliaments, and maybe Modi in India seems a little more of a, you know, less aggressive but still sort of very strong leader. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, and with that comes, interestingly, a clear alignment to specific political parties. Generally speaking, if you were to draw a line in the sand. Which is a road that we won't go down, but the, the similarities no, you, you mentioned don't, there. No, you don't. You don't really. No, um, you can. No, actually, when you they've been doing a lot of work on politics and narcissism, and what you find, my overall take is people who end up in leadership, in political leadership, and want to control people and be famous and have power tend to be narcissistic, and they will go whatever side they they will go into the relig they will go into the clergy they will go into the sainthood they will go into the left they will go into the right they will go wherever they can to get positions of power interesting I, yeah. as you were saying that there were more examples from different sides of the coin springing into my head so i think uh, i was wrong to try and draw a line in the sand there well I, it, it it's not a, it's not an un, it's not you're not the first person to make that line because you go well people on the right are typically a little more individualistic as a as a cultural group and the left it tends to be a little more communal so you go well it seems the leadership would be the same yeah you know they're all leaders are kind of leaders leaders want to control people and be famous and get stuff that's it that's it isn't it so for those listening that are interested in how they can improve their own relationship with their narcissistic self because people listening will be ambitious they'll be hardworking, they'll be aspirational and i don't want anyone listening to feel that those are bad things and i'm sure you don't either but there's a part of me that thinks how do i how do i make sure that i hold myself accountable a key component of cpr to the fact that all of the things that i'm doing don't become in any way misaligned with the reason that I'm doing them. And I think the question that's really formed in my head now is, is there a difference between being selfish for the sake of yourself in terms of the aspirations that you have versus pushing people away from a narcissistic place, if that makes sense? I, I mean, I think these are great questions and I'm glad you're asking them because I'm ambitious. You don't get to be where I am without being, I don't mean to, I don't act, I don't wake up going, gee, I'm an ambitious guy. But now when I look at my life, I am very ambitious and very competitive because I wouldn't be here if I weren't. You just have to be to succeed. And then you start going, well, if I'm that way, does that mean I'm a narcissistic jerk? If I want to change the world, that means I think the world is bad and I'm trying to put my stamp on the world. Am I an arrogant SOB for doing that? I mean, these are important questions because, you know, like I'm breaking stuff, trying to change stuff. I'm on the Internet trying to change people's mind. Well, what kind of egomaniac tells people what to do? I, I struggle with this. And my, my thoughts are this are no one's a saint. You're not a saint. I'm not a saint. We're always going to be motivated by ego. My suggestion would always be, you know, to make sure that your ego motives are aligned with other things that are helping people. So is my doing good helping other people? Is it is there a win-win in there? And then the second thing is, how are your personal relationships with people you love? So if you're doing this work, 
How is your relationship with your family? How is it with your partner? How is it with your parents? Is that relationship getting stronger or weaker? And sometimes when you put yourself, you know, I'm going to be 100% focused on writing this book. I'm not spending time with my kids. That's just the cost. But are you becoming, do you, do you regret that? Or are you like going, well, who needs those kids? I got my fans and they're better than my children. Well, no, they're not. Your fans are going to dump you before your children. Um, so I think a lot of it is just asking those questions. And uh, there is no, I mean, I, look, maybe I'm just kind of uniquely not a saint, but I just generally find most people aren't saints. Most people are struggling. They want to do well for themselves. They want to do well for other people. And what you notice in life is the higher you rise, you're always working with a team. So the higher you get, you're going to be working with other professionals. You're going to have accountants. You're going to have attorneys. You're going to have physicians. And you need to get along with all those people to succeed. And if you're an arrogant prick, you're not going to. And no one's going to want to be your friend. And you're going to fail. It seems it all comes back to what it always comes back to, which is your reasons why as to why you're doing the things that you're doing in the first place. If you're... Yeah ignoring your kids to write your book because the book's the thing that's important because it's going to make me feel great and it's going to make me seem great and fantastic then you're probably being quite narcissistic but if you're thinking right if i get my head down and crack on with this book and for the next three months i'm not going to spend as much time with my kids as i'd like but the back end the commercial gain that comes from it means that actually i'm going to have a bit more freedom which means i can spend my time fishing in the spay with them for example yeah. And those are two very, very different sides of the same coin, aren't they? And that really oh. is my understanding in terms of the core of narcissism versus ego, ambition, aspiration, and the real key distinction that actually has helped me go full circle into understanding where I fit on the spectrum rather than at the start. I was thinking, oh, Christ, Keith's, uh, Keith's describing me a little bit here. What's happening? That's What's right. happening? <laughs> Dude, nobody, I, I talk to so many successful people and nobody wants to talk to me because they're like, he's going to say I'm a narcissist. I'm like, dude, who, no matter what, you're not worse than me. And we all struggle with this stuff. I mean, everyone struggles with like, how do I be a good person, but still keep, you know, keep crushing stuff and, you know, you make it work. What do you teach your kids about this? Because you are in a unique position to be very well informed on the academia behind this and that gives you a unique position to be able to give them an understanding for the world to follow or have you just accepted you know what child number one parenting child number two genetics leave them to it i uh i'm laughing so hard because i got a text from my daughter this morning in edinburgh that said dad did you hold me over a crocodile when i was a child and if so why did you do that <laughs> yeah, core, core, core not, memory I'm, revealed I mean, i'm not kidding i'm look at this i'm just not kidding and i said sweetheart it was a it was an alligator it wasn't a crocodile <laughs> and i wanted you and i did that and a lot of other things so you learned appropriate you learned courage but appropriate caution and so I have never given parenting advice. I was, I took my, my poor daughter, I took her scuba diving the first time when she was 10. I took all my kids cage diving with great whites in South Africa. My youngest was nine, just because I figured after that, she'd be like, I'd be like, look, you got in a cage with a great white. Why are you complaining? You can do this. Um, I, 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 uh, my way of raising my kids was just to have a lot of adventures and, uh, that was about it. I I don't I I don't give advice on parenting. They all turned out okay, but, but. it it sounds like the, the the key is exposure and actually humility, perhaps, and that probably goes the whole way through. Whereby the more exposure you have to things that will teach you lessons, the sooner you learn those lessons, the better prepared you'll be to better understand your own relationship with your ego, with your ambition, with your aspirations, and not fall into the trap of becoming mindlessly narcissistic. Hey, you know, you made my parenting sound actually legitimate because that is what I'm trying to do. If you hang out with big wave surfers, they never have egos. They're like the toughest guys in the world. They don't have egos because they've been scared to death so many times and thought they would die and they're grateful to be here and they know how small they are compared to the world. And when you go out there and face the world over and over, you have nothing but humility because you are like, I am grateful to be here every day. I can think of every time it could have gone the wrong way. Um, but you also have the capacity to take risk because you've taken enough risks, you know how. And so 
I've put my kids to the extent I can in places where they've seen the world and taken safe, what I thought was safe risks. And my, again, my judgment of safety is a little extreme for people. I, I mean, I, I brought them to Europe during the pandemic because we had tickets and I couldn't cancel them. I'm like, oh, well, only a 3% chance of dying. I mean, that's who you're dealing with when you're talking to me. We were, we were like the last people in Amsterdam, the last tourists before they kicked us out. So it's prob- probably much easier to ride a bike without too much foot traffic, actually. So you've oh, we, it well. We had the, I mean, I, I was the last tour boat. It was amazing. Um, my point is I take a, I, I have a very high capacity for risk and I've done that with my kids. And I think that's given me a lot of humility because I've been wrong so many times, but I'm not recommending that to anybody. You just asked. So I'm telling you what I did. And it made me laugh because my daughter's text. The timing almost seems too perfect there as you've had to reflect on the uh, alligator dangling the well-known sport in Georgia as uh, as, 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 I believe that's it's it's very very (laughs) they were cold it was cold they're just little they're out they're not crocodiles or alligators they're not that scary and there's there's lots of them in your part of the world Florida and Georgia are full of them oh yeah we've we've got it we've got a few yeah Yeah, we we just have uh we just have deer that have become so (laughs) inbred and croissant fed by tourists that <laughs> they're overrun and i think they're actually considering bringing hunting back into the highlands in some parts of it to actually deal with the, the pest problem that comes with them but wildlife wise it always makes me laugh hearing about americans or australians dealing with these mad creatures that are just readily available on the side of the road <laughs> yeah so, you got nothing left yeah i i know anyway anyway um, anyway i think there's an awful lot to be taken away there and i have definitely gone on a bit of a full circle journey myself in this conversation for which i really appreciate from a personal point of view but i'm sure that others will have taken things away from it too so for anyone that wants to find out a bit more about your published works your academia you've got a ted talk animation and things that people can watch that's obviously very there's lots of succinct ways of understanding this more from a personal point of view where would you like them to go um i i'm not for i wkeithcampbell.com maybe uh it's my website i don't know i'm not very good at self-promoting books on amazon i'm on oh yeah books on amazon sometimes i'm on twitter at w keith campbell sometimes i tweet stuff i look forward to the next time that you do and i can uh, (laughs) i mean it could be it could be next week uh, just a picture of your daughter hanging over an alligator i'm expecting oh god i get they would sue me take her away they take her she's already an adult they take her from me yeah, you know, you maybe keep that one under, in in the shoebox under the bed and let yeah, her enjoy just... her time in Edinburgh. <laughs> For sure. That's the way to go. Well, Keith, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully with my very non-Scottish accent, I've made you feel somewhat more at home by describing how bad the weather has suddenly turned outside. So you can feel like you're getting a bit of your Campbell clan culture. I, I feel good there. right now. I'm ready to go to war with somebody. I'm not sure who, but it feels good. Don the tartan and go and wrestle an alligator. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> time well thank you very much again and uh yeah look forward to seeing how everything unfolds very soon awesome thanks so much fergus appreciate it